model of the diseases that I've dealt with, which the worst case scenario actually came out. They always overshoot. So when you use numbers like a million, a million and a half, two million, that almost certainly is off the chart. Now it's not impossible, but very, very unlikely. So it's difficult to present. I mean, looking at what we're seeing now, you know, I would say between 100 and 200,000 cases, but I don't want to be held to that because it's, it's, it's uh, excuse me, deaths. I mean, we're, we're going to have millions of cases, but I, I just don't. This is the first part of a series of analysis that updates the current trend trajectories for the coronavirus mega trend. Where whilst the pandemic itself may not last more than a year, nevertheless the magnitude of which is likely to impact many aspects of our lives for decades to come. Well, the purpose of this analysis is to ensure that we're not all getting carried away by media headlines that could be over exaggerating COVID-19 that has resulted in unprecedented government measures especially as a significant percentage of people, usually those yet to experience first-hand consequences of the coronavirus, see it largely in terms of being a corona hoax, fake news, a grab for power, a pandemic. The elites once more playing their power games to enrich themselves, just as they did during the financial crisis. Now, the whole of this analysis was first made available to patrons who support my work, including the next analysis in this series that will update the UK and US trend trajectories and stock market implications thereof, and update AI stocks buying levels for Q2 to be posted soon after the release of Tuesday's ONS data that will first be made available to patrons who support my work. So, for immediate first access to all of my analysis and trend forecasts, then do consider becoming a patron by supporting my work for just $3 per month. So, whilst the trend trajectory forecast to date have proven useful in warning well ahead of time of potentially catastrophic consequences for the UK and US, and where the UK is concerned even before its first corona death, Nevertheless, as can happen with bull and bear markets, that one can get carried away by prevailing sentiment, where today's extreme pessimism has flipped near 180 degrees from that of barely a month ago, where those in the media and politics today who issue the loudest hysterical warnings were underplaying its consequences barely a month ago. Now the loudest voices calls for a flattening of the curve as everyone peers over similar logarithmic charts, many for probably the first time. Even though in technical terms such charts are not that useful towards making accurate projections. So is COVID-19 for real or is it overhyped and in reality little worse than seasonal flu? From those sceptical of the coronavirus, the argument goes that those who are being reported as dying of coronavirus would have died anyway of something else. For instance, the flu kills 650,000 people per year, far higher than the 100,000 or so who have died as a consequence of COVID-19. In the UK, the flu usually kills about 17,000 people per year, so currently near double the number of corona deaths to date while CDC estimates 12,000 to 60,000 US deaths against COVID-19 deaths of around 18,000. So given the current tallies, those sceptical of the coronavirus can make convincing arguments for it being overhyped, that there are ulterior motives at work for the economically costly lockdowns, ranging from trying to control people's actions to big pharma profiting from mass vaccinations. Of course, the flaw in the not worse than the flu argument is that the flu season runs for seven months, whilst COVID death data being used barely covers three weeks. So here's how America's annual flu season deaths compare against the coronavirus. US annual flu deaths average at 61,000 per year in the range of 46,000 to 96,000. 
The largest death toll was week 3 of 2018 with 1625 deaths. If one totaled the maximum weekly deaths of all 8 years of data, and that would total about 6,500 flu deaths for one week, i.e. adding up 8 years of maximum weekly flu deaths data, which is set against the US this past week experiencing 11,626 reported COVID-19 deaths, which implies that COVID-19 is currently operating at a death rate that of 14 times that of the flu. And here's another chart of the daily US deaths up to the 4th of April that shows that even at that stage, coronavirus deaths were several orders of magnitude greater than the flu. So the error here, whether deliberate or not, is that when comparing the flu to COVID-19, is by comparing a seven month flu season against three weeks of COVID deaths and that the government panic interventions in the form of lockdowns are aimed at greatly curbing the rising death tolls going forward which just does not happen during flu seasons that run for seven months. And here's another example of why things have changed so rapidly when a month ago few took it seriously whilst today is highly probable most people are taking it very seriously. Whilst I'm sure conspiracy theorists will argue that virtually every death taking place today is being labelled as a consequence of COVID-19 and thus the scary numbers being broadcast each day, therefore in the interest of understanding what is actually taking place, then to test whether the danger of COVID-19 is real or exaggerated, i.e. that the people who are dying would have died anyway of something else, then the answer to this question will be in the weekly total number of registered deaths data. Where if coronavirus is mostly hype, then the total number of weekly deaths should not significantly vary above normal expectations based on the averages of recent years, which is thus the focus of this analysis. Against this, my analysis of approaching now three months well, since 28th of January has pushed me firmly towards the risks of coronavirus being real and thus the implications of which were to expect a stocks bear market and economic contraction as being the most probable outcome that has come to pass. That and giving investors a golden opportunity to buy AI stocks mid-March at typically prices 33% off their January highs for AI stock sector megatrend stocks. That further went on to expect the coronavirus stocks bear market to bottom before the end of March as my forecast graph from early March illustrates. However, I do in part agree with the conspiracy theories to some extent for differing reasons in that after ignoring the pandemic for the whole of February and early March, the mainstream establishment swung in the opposite direction and has gone from coronavirus being of little consequences to an Armageddon event with projected death tolls for the UK and US running in the millions. UK 1.4 million, US 2.2 million if the lockdowns had not been implemented. Where even if my forecasts for the UK and US do turn out to be significant underestimates, nevertheless the actual number of deaths is going to be nowhere near official projections of 200,000 for the UK, which was recently revised down to 20k, and 100k to 250k for the US. However, unlike the conspiracy theories who bandy about made up figures, that the number of deaths in the UK and US are not abnormal and thus COVID-19 is a fake pandemic. I really do want to know the answer to this question for which obviously we have to wait for the deaths to be registered and show up in the official statistics. For the UK the answer lies with the Office of National Statistics ONS the weekly figures of the number of deaths registered in the UK where if COVID-19 was resulting in a lot of extra deaths then there should be a spike in the number of deaths registered. 
The latest data published is for the week ending the 27th of March, with the data for the week ending 4th of April expected to be published on the 14th of April. The ONS lists the total number of registered deaths in England and Wales set against the five-year average, which have been further broken down by flu and COVID-19 deaths. Analysis of the data shows that the total deaths are 10% higher than the seasonal average, whilst flu deaths are also up about 5% against the five-year average. So at the very least, flu deaths are not being labelled as COVID-19 deaths. However, if you take the flu deaths out of the equation, then there were 904 more deaths than the seasonal trend, of which 539 were registered as COVID-19, against 582 for the UK as a whole for the same period. Thus, 365 deaths that could also be COVID-19 deaths in the community were not tested for COVID, which implies that the COVID death toll could be as much as 60% higher than reported. However, a 10% increase in the total number of weekly deaths, while significant, is not something that would warrant the blind panic of a total lockdown. Though, of course, this data is just for week two of when the number of COVID deaths first exceeded 100. So, Tuesday's data, unless it is delayed, should prove definitive in whether the broadcast COVID-19 death numbers are real or exaggerated. Where my following table for the week ending the 3rd of April, for which there were 3,554 reported COVID deaths in the UK, 90% of which were in England, at least 90%. However, against this, anywhere from 25% to 60% of the deaths are in the community, which are not being counted as COVID-19 deaths in the official Public Health England statistics. Therefore, I am expecting the number of deaths reported by the ONS for England to be at least 40% higher than the average of recent years, where for every percentage below that number, then the less significant coronavirus actually is, and where for every percentage above that level, the greater is the significance and danger of COVID-19. Furthermore, given that there is a lag of between 3 and 5 weeks between the impact of the lockdowns and the number of deaths, then the trend trajectory for the week ending the 10th of April is to expect to result in an even greater percentage increase in the total number of weekly deaths by at least 60% above normal. And it is also possible that before we pass the peak that the number of weekly deaths it's double the usual number of weekly deaths. So I'm expecting every Tuesday's ONS day release for the next few weeks to grab media headlines as the number of registered deaths keeps increasing way beyond seasonal norms and harbingers of what would have transpired had the government not locked down Britain after being negligent in the containing of the pandemic. It also illustrates that the average person's obsession with wanting to thank the NHS is largely misguided as Britain's healthcare system is likely the worst performing in Western Europe, which will be revealed much later when comparisons are made between what each EU nation suffered at the hands of the Wuhan flu. And this despite the UK having advance warning of what was coming. And at some point I will look at conducting a similar exercise for the United States. Though I still expect the US to follow a better trend trajectory than the UK. For the United States has had advance warning on top of advance warning. So has no excuse for doing worse. And my next analysis will update the UK and US trend trajectories and stock market implications thereof and update AI stocks buying levels for Q2 to be posted 
probably soon after release of Tuesday's ONS data that will be first made available to patrons who support my work. So for immediate first access to all of my analysis and trend forecasts then do consider becoming a patron and supporting my work for just $3 per month. And also ensure you are subscribed to this YouTube channel for the next video in this coronavirus series as we count down to the flattening of the curve and hopefully better times ahead. <laughs>